Praise the Lord. It's a joy to be here with you this morning. Uh, theology is off session this semester, and so you're a different group of people to me, so it's a delight to see you here and worship with you. Um, I work a lot from home, and in my office at home on the wall in front of the desk, I have a number of scriptures and quotes that I like, and I recently added one that I think is appropriate for today from C.S. Lewis, and it says, Look for Christ, and you will find him, and with him everything else. Look for Christ, and you will find him, and with him everything else. Our theme this morning is holding on to the right path, and in his message from Philippians 3, Paul shows us how to do this, how to stay on the right path. Now, of course, Philippians is one of the letters that Paul wrote from prison, and so we know it's a prison letter. We know it's a letter of joy, that the word joy is just repeated and infused throughout the book. But basically, this is a thank you note. Philippians is a thank you note. He's writing to the church to thank them for the contributions they have made to him throughout his ministry, but particularly while he has been in prison. The church is very, has been very generous and has very much cared for Paul monetarily, but as well as cons being concerned for his welfare, and he is just appreciating them. But Paul is never one to miss an excuse to preach, and so while after he has thanked them, he has been encouraging them and reminding them to live godly Christian lives. And he's also taking the time to warn them of false prophets who have entered the congregation. Paul is a good shepherd, always looking out for the sheep. The shepherd's job, of course, is to keep the sheep safe. And that is what Paul is doing, even from prison, ensuring that his, <coughs> his Christians are being well cared for. And in the section that we read today, Paul is wrapping up his exhortations on living a Christian life by reminding them to hold on to the right path because the congregation was facing pressures from Judaizers. So the Judaizers had come in, and they are the ones who wanted to live according to the law. Now, of course, we have the law in the Old Testament. God gave the law as the way for his people to be made right with him, but that was before Jesus. And since Jesus, the law has been fulfilled, there's no reason to follow the law anymore, but the Judaizers wanted to pull these Christians back. And um, where I come from, we have a saying, if you cannot be an example, you can at least be a lesson. And so Paul, <laughs> Paul is giving us both a lesson and an example. The lesson is the Judaizers, and the example is going to be Paul himself. And one of my commentaries divided this chapter, well, this section of this chapter into three parts. The introduction, the lesson, the example to be avoided, and then the example to be followed. So first, Paul's introduction. It's very brief. And yes, this is the letter of joy. So Paul is reminding them, finally, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It's the theme that we should always have in our hearts as Christians. But he goes right into reminding them of the challenges that they have because he wants to protect them. It is no trouble for me to write these things, these same things to you again. So he has told them about the Judaizers before. He has told them and he's reminding them, you have false prophets among you. Be careful. Do not be like these people because these false shepherds are here to steal the sheep. And we have to watch out for false teachers and false prophets, don't we? Unfortunately, there are far too many of them in the world. Last night, I googled false prophets Uganda. Hmm, I like to live on the edge. And the results were fascinating and depressing. Fascinating, you know, in an academic kind of way, I'm looking in at these things. Fascinating because the things that were described were really, really wild. All kinds of people, I am a prophet, praise the Lord. Ah, oh, my 
my friend, Benangi. No, no, no. I am not a prophet. I have spiritual gifts. Prophecy is not one of them. But, and I know this, thank God. But the people, no, when we operate outside our gifts, we get into problems. But the people who stand up, I am a prophet. Come pray to me. That, that word too is a problem. The only one we pray to is God. Come worship me. Uh, then what you do is you come and you start caning me. No, we, who do we worship? We worship God. Do we worship people? No. I am the one with truth. Is that true? No. I know the truth. I will tell you the truth. But I am not the truth. The truth is Jesus. So, many people saying these things. A lot of it tied to witchcraft. One testimony was really long. And I could not finish it because it made me sick to my stomach. No, really. Drinking blood and... Yeah. Demonic. Demonic. Praise the Lord. I think, I think this woman was delivered. I could not finish. I think she was. So, that's the depressing part. These, these false prophets are stealing people. They are stealing. It's, it's shameful. It's painful. And that is why we need to be on, on our guard, because these prophets are here to deceive, and sometimes they are successful. So, to the example to be avoided, the Judaizers. <clears throat> Yes, they were the ones who wanted to draw the Christians back to Judaism, and they said that righteousness could only be found in the law, which is no longer true. It was true, and then Jesus came, fulfilled the law, and they were denying the grace and mercy that Jesus was offering, isn't it? By saying you have to go back to the law, we're completely negating the grace and the mercy and the love that Jesus offered us on the cross. Now, of course, one of the false uh, teachings now is the complete opposite, hypergrace, isn't it? Ah, you're saved, you can do whatever you want, my brother, didn't you know? You can do anything you want because you have been forgiven. Praise the Lord! He's looking at me like, what? Which is good. <laughs> yes, we need to be discerning. We need to be discerning. We have to know these things. And so Paul, of course, one of the things I appreciate about Paul is that he does not mince words. Look at what he says about this group, starting in verse 2. Watch out for those dogs. Whoo! Dogs are what the Jews called the Gentiles. This is quite an insult. You unclean people. You're not even human. You dogs. A little ironic. You know, for the, for the Jews who call the unclean people this, he's calling the people who think they are the best in Judaism the same thing. Then what does he say? Those men who do evil. It's not that they are somehow okay but confused. No, they're doing evil. Let's call it what it is. Those mutilators of the flesh. Um, Paul is... Uh, being a little sarcastic here because the Judaizers believed that to be saved you had to be circumcised, which of course is no longer the true and uh, under Christ, and they completely missed the point that what the Lord wants more than physical circumcision is the circumcision of the heart. Paul explained it very well in Romans 2.29, and yet the Judaizers insisted on fulfilling the letter of the law while forgetting the intent behind it. But then he notes, he ends verse 3, he ends this lesson by noting that it is we who are the circumcision. Huh. So they have it wrong, by the way. We are the ones who are the circumcision. We are the ones who worship by the Spirit of God and who glory in Christ Jesus. And we put no confidence in the flesh. So he is on the right path, putting no confidence in the flesh. Because he worships God in spirit, he rejoices in Christ. And then he moves to the example to be followed. And he starts with, I have reasons to be confident in who, who I am. And then he goes to explain them. He has 
Paul has an exemplary pedigree and heritage and religiosity. All these things are flawless in Paul according to Jewish customs and traditions, and it does not matter. Look at what he says. Uh, verse 4b, if anyone else thinks he has reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more, you know, because Paul is so humble. I have more. So, circumcised on the eighth day, according, to, he fulfilled the law. Now, when you're eight days old, can you do much? Not really. So his parents did this for him. His parents followed the law and brought him in um, compliance with it. Of the people of Israel, he was a Jew. Of the tribe of Benjamin, Benjamin, of course, was the tribe of the first king of Israel. Hebrew of Hebrews, the highest of them all. In regard to law, a Pharisee. So he was a ruler, and he was very well educated. Very well educated. Remember, he studied under Gamaliel, the best tutor. He had the best education, and he's showing it off right now. As for zeal, persecuting the church, which we know. As for legalistic righteousness, faultless. Paul recites all this. One, he's proud of it, and he has a right to be. I think most of us are proud of our heritage, aren't we? I'm proud of my heritage, both American and Ugandan. Yes, it's true. Ah, you people, I'm an adopted Muganda. I am. Yes, I come from the Lion Clan. Uh-huh. My names are Nakalema and Nasuna. Hmm. What does that tell you about me? What does that tell you about me? Yeah, you know I'm something special. So on the American side, my people settled Jamestown. So my people were the ones who left England and settled in Jamestown first. We call that the first family of Virginia to trace our lineage back to those people. I knew that I was a first family of Virginia before I knew what it meant to be, because my parents told me. Because to some people, that is very important. Me, I think it's interesting, but what am I going to do with that? Especially here, but even in the States, what am I going to do? Does it change anything about me? Mm -mm. So what does Paul say about all this? So he's listed all these things. He's done all this. Oh, by the way, so I did my Masters of Divinity here. Yes, I'm a graduate of UCU. Uh-huh. Reverend Sampson was the year ahead of me. Reverend Amos and I were classmates. And one day in class, I don't remember why, one of my classmates said that he could, you know, talking how far back he could trace his ancestry. And he stood up and he went back like to Noah. He just kept going. I am the son of, the son of, the son of. And he kept, and I'm looking at him going, I can only go to my grandparents. What? And he's going and going and going. He know, I mean like back to Noah, that far. <laughs> Seriously. He went on for like 20 seconds. It was, it's impressive. What does that get us? I mean, I'm glad he can do that. I wish I could. But what does it get us? What does it get him? What do you think Paul says? Verse 7, Paul says, Whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. Hmm. Even though from birth, Paul was set on the right path as a Jew. Remember, circumcised on the eighth day, born of the tribe of Benjamin, he was set on the right path to, for a Jew. He followed that path, and then he met Jesus, and he realized he was on the wrong path. He realized, and he got on the right one. And now, what does he think? Does he think, oh, that's good, but I'm just moving a different way? No, he consis considers it a loss. It does not matter. It does not matter. And then he, he, then he repeats himself. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. So, there's two things to bring out here. I consider everything a loss 
What did he lose? His heritage, his keeping the law, his prestige, his education, his education. You, you're here getting an education, aren't you? You're striving for your first class. I would have had a first class. I was a master's student. We did not have first class, but I would have been first class. It does not matter. Everything he accomplished, being a Pharisee, his zeal for the things of God comes to nothing compared to what he has in Christ. And notice that he says at the end of, at the second part of that verse, for whose sake I have lost all things. Becoming a Christian cost Paul. It, it cost him. He likely lost his family. He lost his place in society. He, he likely lost everything to know Jesus. It's a hard thing. It's a very hard thing. And yet, what does he say? It doesn't matter. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ. Now, English is not a good language for scriptures. No, it really isn't. We lose a lot of the um, nuances of the original language. You know this when you're translating from your, your local language into English. Can you always find the right word? No, and, and the word is, the English word is like, yeah, but it's not quite that, it's more. Same thing, so when Paul says it's rubbish, what he really said in the Greek is that this is trash, this is refuse, it's dung. He said it's dung. That's what the Greek says. This is excrement. All these things that I valued and I thought were fabulous, yeah, they're dung compared to Jesus. Strong words, aren't they? Strong words. Talking about being on one path and choosing another. This path is so right, he's willing not only to turn away from what he had, but to describe it in very strong terms. And why did he do that? Gaining Christ and being found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own. Remember, I said Paul is very humble, and in many ways he was, but I also think sometimes he might have been a little cheeky. Eh? Read his writings. I think you'll agree with me. So not having a righteousness of my own, he does not want to count on himself. He doesn't want to. That is a high challenge for us because me, I'm rather proud. I mean, aside from the whole first family of Virginia and princess thing, I'm a very, I can be very proud. But to decide, no, I don't want this. I need it to be Jesus. That is really what I want. It's not always easy to do, but that is what I want. And how does Paul get this? So a righteousness not of his own that comes from the law, but which is found through faith in Christ. And then he continues to go on about how this is the right path. In verse 10, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection of the dead. That is the right path. And there's a lot in here, so let's break these down for a minute. So first, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. We all love to celebrate resurrection, don't we? It's a good thing. Resurrection is good. Taking something that was dead and bringing it to life. Breathing new life, new creation. This is a great thing, isn't it? That is something to praise the Lord about. Yes? Yes. But what do you have to be in order to be resurrected? You have to be dead. Death is often painful. So as much as we like to sing and dance about our new life in Christ, I think sometimes we might forget that we have to die to ourselves. I think we might forget we have to die to ourselves. And death can be painful, but that resurrection is something fabulous, isn't it? That resurrection is fabulous. It is worth the pain of death. Paul has already explained all the things that he, is, that he has pushed off, his heritage, his education, his zeal for the law. 
And now he's pointing out very clearly that not only is he willing to push them off, he's a willing to let them die in order to know more of Jesus because he does not want anything to block him. He does not want anything to block him from getting closer to Jesus, and so he's willing to let them die. In his letter to the Ephesians, in chapter 1, verses 19 to 20, Paul wrote about the power of Jesus' resurrection, that it is his incomparably great power, incomparably, nothing compares to it, great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. It is incomparably, incomparably great. Nothing can compare. And it's for all of us. Praise the Lord. Then Paul says he wants, to, he wants the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. How many of us want to suffer? No hands? None? Choir? None? Oh, one! Woo! Brave man. Was that two? I see one. Okay. You're strong. Most of us are wimps. I'm a wimp. To participate in the sufferings of Christ, John Piper says this, one of the purposes of the suffering of the saints is that their relationship with God might become less formal and less artificial and less distant and become more personal and more real and more intimate and close and deep. And I think that's very true. It's very easy to walk along our relationship with Jesus and when everything is fine, yes, we dance, praise the Lord. But when you have a testimony, is it from when things are good? Are your testimonies from when things are good? Or are they from challenges? They're from challenges because we've had to persevere. We've had to press into God. And things become more personal and more real. God shows himself how real he is and more intimate, we are drawn closer to him, and our relationship becomes deeper. Paul certainly knew suffering for Jesus, didn't he? Paul knew suffering. How many times was he imprisoned? How many times was he shipwrecked, floating around in the sea, not knowing if he would be rescued? How many times was he flogged? All of these are more than one. I know you know that. His passion for Christ was so intense that he did not want to live a comfortable life. He wanted to embrace the sufferings of Christ because he knew it would draw him closer to his Lord. And I have to say that I'm very aware that that is when I grow closer to God, but do I want the sufferings of Christ? Hmm. I'm not so sure. But it's how we grow. It is how the church grows. You've heard the saying, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. The church grows when it is persecuted. You look to the countries where the gospel is illegal and the church is on fire. The church is on fire. These people, these are brothers and sisters, know they can be killed for their faith and they preach Jesus anyway because he is the truth. They have a deep and intimate relationship with God. And last, Paul says he wants to become like him in his death. Some commentaries think that Paul, what Paul is meaning is that um, he wanted to live a life crucified, dying to sin, dying to self and to the world. And I think Paul has made it clear that that is his desire. But I wonder if, if there's a deeper meaning. One commentary suggested that Paul had, a stent, had, a, had a, attended Stephen's stoning. Remember, he stood there as Stephen was killed, the first martyr, approving his death. And so this one commentary is wondering if seeing P Stephen's devotion encouraged Paul to have the same devotion, to be so dedicated to be willing to die for his faith. I don't know. I mean, I can ask, we can ask Paul when we get to heaven. But 
But I have a long list of questions when I get to heaven. Very long. But as much as I do not want to suffer, I will die for my faith. I'm never going to recant. Never. Never, 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 never. And I don't think you will either. But this is the right path we have to walk. When these false teachers come in, we have to speak the truth. We have to return to the word. We have to share in Jesus Christ. We have to share our resurrection. We have to share our deep love for Christ. And then the passage that we read today ends with a wonderful encouragement. I think of Paul as the chief among the apostles. But what did Paul call himself? He called himself the chief of sinners. And yet we think of him so well and he's like, no, no, chief of sinners here. But he gives a good encouragement that is helpful to me because as much as I look up to him, what did he say? Not, verse 12, not that I have already obtained this. He, if Paul was not there, my friends, you are not there. I like you a lot, but you're, you have not finished. I have not finished. Dr. Signoni has not finished. I mentioned that at the first sermon. He agreed. None of us have, have finished. None of us have been made perfect. But what did Paul do? I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. And he says, I do not consider myself to have taken hold. But what does he do? Forgetting what is behind. He already told us that he's forgetting. Straining on towards what is head. Straining. It's not an easy path. Jesus said the path is narrow. It is not easy to walk on. But Paul was persevering. He was keeping on to this right path in order to attain Jesus and more of him. I press on towards the goal to win the prize to which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul wants that prize, and he is not stopping. And we, too, need to persevere. We also need to press in and strain towards the prize. Our conversion is just the beginning, of course. We die to ourselves. We rise in Christ. Praise the Lord. But that is just day one. How many more days until we meet Jesus? I don't know. I hope it's many. And I hope that with each one, we seek to draw closer to Jesus a little bit more each day. Paul, of course, knew when his life was ending, when he was finished running the race, he told Timothy this in 2 Timothy 4, 7, when he thought his death was imminent. He wrote, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. Those are hard words, because when you finish the race, then what? When you're finished, you're finished. I have kept the faith, but that is good news. I have kept the faith. He stayed on the right path. That is the only time to rest from pursuing Jesus. Now, Paul, of course, has been using athletics as a metaphor, and it was used quite a lot in the time when Paul was writing. And he talks about finishing the race. And if you're running a race, what do you do? Are you looking at the finish line? Are you looking at the finish line when you run, or are you looking around to see what the competitors are doing? Oh, has he caught up to me? Are you looking around? No, you're looking straight at the finish line, aren't you? You have to focus, because what happens if you lose your focus? You go off course. During the Olympics, there was a great meme about Usain Bolt. You know him, the fastest man alive, running, what, in what, 7.4 seconds or something incredibly fast. So there's this, this meme of him and the other two competitors with him. And, and it's a blurry because, of course, they're so fast. And, in, and he's, he's turned and he's smiling to the camera. Man, you guys are on point. Yeah, so there it is. Now, this is Photoshop at its finest because if you are the man's, the world's fastest man, do you have time to turn your head and smile at a camera when you're running? Are you going to do this? No, you're going to be focusing ahead. Even if you're ahead as, by as much as him, you're not smiling at anyone. 
until you finished. After you finish the finish line, after you cross the finish line, then you smile. Then you slow down. But you do not slow down before the finish line. What happens if you slow down before the finish line? You lose. You lose. Did Usain Bolt lose? Did he lose? Did he lose all of his races, Bishop? Not all of them. He does have Bishop. He did lose one, but he has many medals. Why? Because he was focused. He had his eye on the prize. No runner of his caliber would ever do that. It's a nice photo and it's funny. No serious runner would ever do that. How does that apply to us? Does any serious Christian take his or her eyes off the cross? Do you turn your head to listen to these false prophets and these false teachers who tickle our ears? Or do you shut them down? keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. The author of the letter to the Hebrews reminds us of this, telling us in chapter 12 that we have to throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. By the way, those are two things, the things that hinder and the sin that entangles. Not everything that hinders is sin, by the way. That's a separate sermon, but not everything that hinders is sin. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, not turning to the side, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Yes, we're called to, suffer, called to share in the fellowship of his sufferings, but Jesus endured so much more. So I began with that quote from Lewis, and it looks like it was a paraphrase. Look for Christ and you will find him, and with him everything else. Lewis had the same devotion to Christ that Paul had. Looking for Christ and finding him and finding everything else, everything that is worth having, beyond heritage, beyond education, beyond self-perceived righteousness, that is the only way to be. And that's my prayer for us, that we would throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and keep our eyes fixed on Jesus.